Hey everybody, I'm Carl Kirby, and this time we get to do something fun. At least I, I think it's fun. We're going to talk about what the best evidence is that God created. Because I don't, I, I don't want just good evidence. I want the best evidence evidence that God created. So we're going to take a journey and see what we can't find here. Let's start off in scripture though, because that's always the best place to start. In Psalm 19.1, we read, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go out at night and I see the heavens, the stars scream. The beauty, the order, the design that we see, I'm like amazed. And I love the stars. I just love it at night to see these things. But, but we have to be honest. We live in a world that they look at this exact same evidence and they say, what? There's nothing special about that. I mean, just give it enough time, right circumstances, hydrogen gas, blows up, boom, we got all these things. Whenever I hear that mentality, my mind immediately goes to another place. It really does. And my mind goes to probably one of my most favorite places on the whole planet. It's the beach. Yes. Now, I would hope that you could be with my wife and I at the beach. So here we are, we're on the beach, and I'm sorry, when you're on the beach, you gotta have your sunglasses on. So now we've got our sunglasses on, and we're on the beach. And, and I want you to think about it. We're walking down the beach one day, and we find this thing on the beach, and we're standing there, and we're like, look at this, isn't this amazing? Look at the design, look at the beauty. And some old grumpy guy walks up to us. We all got him. They typically live next door. And they look at us, and they look at the thing, and they're like, what? 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 Can't you see the beauty? Can't you see the design? And the old grumpy guy's like, what are you, new or something? Don't you understand? Every day the tide comes in, the tide goes out, the wind there ain't, and it forms these things on the beach. Now, I gotta ask you a question. Do you genuinely, honestly believe that given enough time, right circumstances, wind, rain, and tide could form this? Of course not. You look at that and know that somebody had to create that, had to make that. There's intelligence involved with that. The heavens declare the glory of God. The beauty, the order, the design that we see screams that. Now, uh, let me take a little bunny trail here for a second. This is this man's ministry. I want to really challenge you to use a gift that the Lord has given you because I don't know what your gift is, but I know that God has given you some gift. This man goes out every day and he makes a new sand carving to preach the gospel. He gets the sand, they do the four. This whole process, this man uses sand to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with a lot of people. And God has uniquely prepared you as well. Again, I don't know what your gift is, but he has given you one. Use that gift. I think we are bound in ministry by our lack of imagination. You look at this sand, though, and you know that somebody had to do it. Well, what does God's Word say? God says in Job, look at the beast, look at the birds, look at the earth, look at the fish. And do you know what they're going to tell you? They're going to tell you that the hand of the Lord has done that. So this is what I want to do. I want to go around the world, and I want to find the best evidence that God created. And the first place we're going to go is New Zealand. And when we get there, I'll show you my favorite insect. It's called the Weta. Now, it might not look like much to you, but it truly is an amazing little bug. Uh, there's over 100 species of Weta. They call it a living fossil. And that's because when you find a fossil Weta, it was a Weta. It hasn't changed. By the way, we, we did that in our... Uh, fossil talk, so I won't go there. But take a look at this one. This is really special because he's got tusks like an elephant. They're pretty rare. There's only three species of this type of weta, and they're, they're, they're pretty rare, and, and I like them. I think they're pretty cool looking, but, 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 he's not my favorite weta because there's another one that I think is even more amazing, and his name is Weta Punga. And I feel bad for him. I really do. Because Weta Punga, uh, he's named after the god of bad looks. I don't think he's ugly. I think he's a mighty good looking cricket, but there's one thing about Wataponga that you may not know. This is the world's heaviest insect. He's not the largest. There's actually another one that has uh, another uh, bug that has, uh, is bigger with the legs. But this is the world's heaviest insect. They weigh twice as much as a mouse. Now, how'd you like to have one of these as a pet? I know that I would. I think that'd be awesome. But this is not the kind of uh, cricket that you come home to and, you know, you kind of shoosh them with a paper or something. This is a big old boy. I think they are amazing. And, and they're, they're getting rare as well, unfortunately. And I love them. I, I truly would love to have this as a pet. But it's not my favorite Weta. It truly isn't because there's another one that I have to show you that's even more amazing. It's called the Cave Weta. Now, 
Do you know what makes the cave water so special? Guess where they live? That's right, caves. How'd you know that? Well, anyway, I bet you didn't know this. There's over 100 species of cave weta. They can jump over six feet. And there's one more thing that is just unbelievable. This is Mr. Cave Weta living in his natural habitat. And I can hear you out there. You're saying, well, that's just a bug in a cave. No, no, no. This is a bug in a cave that's very special. Because think about this. What happens to caves at the top of mountains where they live in New Zealand in the winter time? That's right, it's a sad story. There's no more cave weather because in the wintertime, the snow and the ice come, freezes the bugs solid. They're all gone, they're all dead, right? I mean, frozen solid, no brain activity, no breathing. Three months, they're dead. No, they're not dead. Because guess what, after three months, when the sun comes out and the ice melts and the bug thaws, away he goes. Now, I have a question for you. How in the world does millions of years of random chance processes explain a bug that can be frozen solid for three months? He's got antifreeze in his blood. How do you get antifreeze in his blood? I'm going to say that the heavens declare the glory of God. What we see in the world screams that there's a designer that did what he said that he did. Now, I love to get people engaged with me, and uh, I'll always ask when I'm at the, with an audience and say, okay, now, when I ask you this question, you've got to respond with a certain way. And I'll ask, is this the best evidence that God created? And folks will, I'll have them respond with, not even close. And that's what I want you to know. It's not even close to the best evidence because there's something even more amazing that I've got to introduce you to. And we're going to go to Australia because in Australia, I'm going to show you my favorite lizard. He's called the Moloch Hortus. Now, People that live in Arizona and Texas and Oklahoma, you might look at this and say, well, that's a horned toad. Absolutely not. They are totally different from a horned toad. Matter of fact, let me show you a picture of the two. You can see that their body structure is different, their thorns are different. They are totally different animals. But because I care, ladies, I need to do this for you. We're going to take a little bunny trail here, and we're going to talk about the horned toad. I love horned toads. I did live in Texas and Oklahoma a little bit when I was a young man, and I remember catching horned toads, and they are really cool little pets. Uh, I, I, th I just love them. But there's a couple of things you need to know about them that I found very interesting. They have a unique defense mechanism. One of them is this. When a snake comes along to eat a uh, horned toad, you're going to love this. Here comes Mr. Snake, and he's going to eat the old horned toad. Watch what the horned toad does. The snake's coming. He doesn't run. No, he puffs himself up to look really big to try to scare the snake off. I'm too big. You can't eat me. But when that doesn't scare the snake away, He's got another trick up his sleeve. What happens is he flips over onto his back and plays dead. Are you kidding me? This little lizard flips over onto his back and plays dead. He knows, for whatever reason, that the snake won't eat what it didn't kill. So the snake's like, missed it by that much and goes away. Now watch this old horned toad. Watch him, watch him. <laughs> And so what does he do? As soon as the snake goes away, he flips back over and away he goes. Now, I love that. But that, that defense mechanism won't work with an old coyote. I mean, they'll eat it. They'll eat just about anything they can get their, their teeth on. And so he's got a different defense mechanism for a coyote. So here we go. You see an old coyote come up to him. They found themselves a horned toad. And, and hmm. He can't run away. He's not fast enough to run away. So what does he do? Puff himself up? No, that doesn't work. So this is where he gets super creative. This little animal has glands by their eyes that they can squirt blood. Yes, this is blood. They can squirt it up to six feet, and it has a nasty smell in it, and it will run the old coyote off. Now, ladies, I did that for you. I, I need you to know that you don't want to mess with a horned toad because if you walk up to it, you might get shot. You think I'm joking? We have a dear friend, and they live in uh, Rockwall, Texas, and, and I, she saw me do this talk, and she came up to me afterwards, and she said, Carl, we had a horned toad in our front yard. I went out to look at it, and it shot me right in the face. True story. So, ladies, that's why I, I showed that to you. Okay, anyway. But just be careful with the horned toad. I like them, but they're not a Moloch. Let's talk about the Moloch. The Molochs are amazing. You would think with a name like Moloch, Canaanite god of blood, Hortus, horrible mean, right? Some vicious lizard. It's not vicious. It's a tiny little lizard, and all they eat is one species of ant. Now, this is an ant-eating machine, though. They eat between three to 5,000 ants a day. 
That's a lot of ants. I'd love to have one of those guys around my house. Plus, they eat at 35 APM. Ants per minute. Yeah. Now, one of the things that really stands out here that looks so unique are their thorns. Look at those thorns. Oh, what a great defense mechanism. Now, the thorns are a defense mechanism, but there's another purpose for them, and I'll tell you about it. Their primary defense mechanism, though, is actually camouflage. And these animals are very good at blending in. They live in areas where you've got various browns and yellows and oranges, and they can blend in. This is video. and They just freeze. They literally will just sit there and freeze. And, and the scientists say they're extremely hard to find in the wild because they just will blend in with the background. Even when they walk, they'll take a step and they'll stop with one leg up in the air and take another step with a leg up in the air, and they look like a branch that's blowing in the wind. And they're not big. They're, they're tiny. They're a tiny little lizard. I bought a cast of one because I thought it would be great to take on the road with me and show to the young folks so they could see it and everything. And it was extremely expensive. And when I got it, it was, it was really about this size right here. And I was like, that much money for that little thing? I sent it back. Sorry, I'm a cheapskate. Could not do that. They are tiny, but they are amazing. Now, that bump on the back of the neck, that is extremely important. That's a great design feature. Uh, think of it like this. Uh, it's kind of like a camel's hump. They live in places where it doesn't rain for three to five years. So this is a way that they can store energy for the really bad times. But it also has another purpose. When a bird will attack a lizard, they'll peck on the head and kill him, and then they'll eat him. Well, when a bird attacks a moloch, you can notice how long his neck is. He literally will take his head, tuck it underneath of his arm, and that bump sticks out, the bird thinks that's the head. And when the bird pecks on that bump, it doesn't hurt the lizard. Bird flies away, leaves him alone. Now there's something even more amazing than that bump, and I want to show it to you. You see right there, can, can you see that thorn? Here, let me put a microscope around it. See that thorn right there? Look at the base of the thorn. You see those lines? Those lines are actually grooves in the body of the Moloch. Okay, um, you don't look like you're interested. Hold up. Those grooves go over the entire body of the Moloch. You still don't look like you're interested. You're sitting here telling me, who cares, Carl? Well, the Moloch cares, thank you very much, and there's a reason why he cares. And that reason is because in Namibia, there's a beetle that goes out and stands on his head every day for three hours. Do you know why they stand on their head for three hours every day? Because if they didn't, they wouldn't be called a head standing beetle. No, there's another reason, and it's much more important. They stand on their head at a very specific time. During this time, there's a mist. This is the world's driest place, right? They stand on their head, and there's a mist that comes in, and that mist will accumulate on their carapace, on their shell, and their carapace is a very special set of grooves that run down to the mouth so that they can get a drink of water. Now, who taught the beetle to go stand on his head for three hours to get a drink? The heavens declare the glory of God. How about this? The first beetle that figured out that they had to stand on their head to get a drink, how'd they pass that information on? Now, son, let me tell you, you go stand on your head for three hours, get yourself a drink of water, but it's got to be... You think beetles talk like that? Not unless they're from Chicago, they don't. I'm just telling you. And you look at the carapace, you see those grooves? Those grooves just so happen, oh, it's an amazing stroke of luck over millions of years, just so happen to run down the carapace to their mouths so that they can funnel the water and they can survive. By the way, scientists have been studying this little bug and they've come up with what they call the aqua mat. They put these mats on huts and now people are living in places that they couldn't live before because they're collecting water. In, in uh, California, they, collect, they use mats to collect the water so they can now live in places where they couldn't be done before because they studied a little tiny beetle. Now, what's that got to do with the Moloch? Thank you very much. That's a good question. The Moloch will catch that dew on those thorns. The dew runs down the thorns to the grooves collect, and the, will collect the water in the grooves. The Moloch has a pump in his throat. He can work that pump and he moves water from anywhere on his body up to his mouth to get a drink. In addition, there's something else that catches do, grass. So the Moloch will walk under the grass. Watch, they walk under the grass. The thorns hit the grass, drop the dew onto his body. He works that pump and then he can draw that water from anywhere on his body up to his mouth to get a drink. The heavens declare the glory of God and this little lizard. By the way, if this little lizard finds a, a damp sand, 
damp sand. He can walk up, he'll stand in that damp sand, he'll work that pump, draw the moisture, draw the water up his leg to his mouth to get a drink. Now I've got a simple question for you. What happened to the first Moloch that had the pump and he had the thorns, but he didn't have the grooves? Not going to work. How about this? He's got the pump, he's got the grooves, but he doesn't have the thorns. Look, you've got to have all these pieces in place or it's not going to work. The Moloch screams that the heavens declared the glory of God. By the way, when they find a puddle of water, they don't walk up and bend down and drink with their mouth when they have a puddle of water. They stand in the water, work the pump, draw the water up their leg to their mouth to get that drink. I love the Moloch. There is no doubt about it. He is my favorite lizard on the entire planet. But I got to ask you a question. Is it the best evidence that God created? And I can hear you. You're saying not even close because it's not. Because if it was, I couldn't apologize to the ladies for the whole blood squirting thing. So I've got to show you something cute, and we're going to go to uh, Antarctica, and that's, that's, we'll show you something cute there. And that's where the ladies really love penguins. And I'm just talking about the emperor penguin, not penguins in general. I'm talking very specifically the emperor penguin. I think Christians need to learn from the emperor penguin. They live in an extremely harsh environment. Uh, did you know that Antarctic was a desert I didn't know that. I thought a desert had to be hot, but desert classification has nothing to do with temperature. It has everything to do with the amount of rainfall, and Antarctic is a desert and it's extremely cold. I found this advertisement in a National Geographic, and this is what it says. 100 below zero, minus 150 wind chill. It could be worse. Yeah, right? About the only way it could be worse is if I was there. 150 below zero? How do they survive? By being totally unique. They're the only penguin that allows close contact. They're the only penguin that uh, lays their egg just before winter when all, all the other penguins are maturing and they're laying, laying their egg just before winter. Why would they do that? Because if they didn't, they wouldn't survive. So think about this. 150 below zero, what do they do? These are the only animals that will get together and keep each other warm. Now, notice that little flap of skin on their belly there. It's kind of like mine, but theirs has a purpose. That special flap of skin lays over the top of that egg, and they can keep that egg warm. So mama lays one egg. All the other penguins are laying mostly two. Lays that one egg. She gives it to daddy, then she goes fishing for three months. Now, let's be honest here. That's not right. Daddy's supposed to go fishing. Mama's supposed to stay home with the egg. I'm joking. But that's what happens. Mama lays the egg, she gives it to daddy. She uses so much energy to lay that one egg that she's got to go feed for three months to re replace all that energy. So daddy sits there, worst weather on our planet. No sun, <laughs> 150 below zero. How do they survive? Because they will get in close contact with each other. They get in a big old huddle. And I want you to notice this because this is great, but it's, it could also be a bad thing because if you were the last guy to show up and you're on the outside and you got that 100 mile an hour wind, 150 below zero, if you're the last guy on the outside, you're going to freeze and eventually kill off one layer, kill off another layer, kill off another layer, right? Uh-uh, because the emperor penguin works together to survive the worst weather on our planet. It literally is like a corkscrew pattern. You can see the movement here. Everybody takes their turn on the outside. Everybody takes their turn on the inside. They work together to survive the worst weather on our planet. I think Christians need to learn from the emperor penguin. Now, three months later, that egg hatches. Daddy's been on a 90-day fast. Guys, I've heard of all kinds of diets. I've heard of the South Beach diet. I've heard of the Cro-Magnon diet. You got the, all kinds of diets. I'm not doing the penguin diet. A 90-day fast, they lose a third of their body weight. Baby hatches, daddy has one meal that he can feed that baby. He's got one meal. So now it's very important that mama gets home the exact same day or within seven days of the baby hatching or daddy leaves and the baby dies. This is a harsh environment, guys. So how does mama know when to leave the ocean to get home the exact same day or within seven days of the baby hatching? I mean, how do they know that? They do know. I mean, next tell, push to talk, Sat phone? Hey, hon, it's time to come home. I know it's not Verizon because I travel so much and Verizon doesn't work in a bunch of places I go, so I know it's not working in Antarctic. Guys, they literally know. 
But now we have another problem. When mama left to go to the ocean, we're talking, you know, 30 miles from the nest of the ocean. Antarctic doubles in size in the wintertime. So now mama's got to travel double the size as when she left to get home this exact same day or within seven days. How does she know where to navigate? Half of what is there now wasn't there when she left. Does she have like a, a GPS system? Yes, she does. It's called God's protective system. And they will crawl on their belly the entire way to get home the exact same day or within seven days of that baby hatching. Now, the problem's still not solved because when they get home and they have to transfer that baby from daddy to mama, they have to do it within two minutes. If they don't do it within two minutes, that baby's dead. This is a harsh environment. Now, a lot of times when I show these pictures, uh, you've got ladies that are oohing and on about, oh, how cute, baby pig was cute. Well, I've got something cuter coming up, but it is not, not this next picture. And I'll ask you, do you have a really good friend? I mean, a really good friend. I mean, I have a really good friend. It's not this picture. I told you, I got something else coming. Because those are cats. I'm not, a, I'm not a cat guy. I'm a dog guy. Now, there's a reason why I like dogs. And so I just got, I have to tell you, dogs are nice. They're nice. I mean, cats are bullies. All they want to do is fight. Cats are always fighting. It's, and, and just mean. They just want to fight. And it's not just fighting dogs. They fight each other. Cat, cats are just mean. Matter of fact, let me show you a dog in action here. The cat's getting all puffed up, wants to go fight somebody. Watch the dog. He comes up, all right, come on, it's time to go home. And just takes him out of that mess. See, that's a dog. While the cat is just, they're just plain mean. There you go, take him home. Get him out of that mess. And by the way, I bet you you've never heard this. If you've ever been in the military, I bet you you've never heard this on the way out to the front lines. You've never heard anybody say, I wish we had a cat. That's because we're dog guys. I think the dogs just need to rise up and put it into this whole cat thing. Well, anyway, my good friend, he made me feel so good one day. He looked at me and he said, Carl, you look just like a baby penguin. I thought that's a nice guy right there. I mean, uh, you got girls always oohing and on about baby penguins, so it must be because I'm cute, right? Well, I don't know about that, but I know this, a penguin is amazing. They can dive underwater for more than 15 minutes and everything else I've shared with you. They are unbelievable, but are they the best evidence of God created? And I can hear you, not even close. How about this? Let me ask you a question here. See if you can figure this one out. I'm going to share an animal with you that lives on every continent except the Antarctic. You know what it is? How about this? Let me help you a little bit more. What hops carries a chunk in a pouch? and is green. So no, it's not a kangaroo. It's actually a kanga frog. Now, I know what some of you are thinking there's no such thing as a kanga frog, and that's true. There is not such a thing as a kanga frog, but there is a marsupial frog, and they are green, and they hop, and yes, they have a pouch. This is unbelievable. Mama will lay the egg, daddy will fertilize it, then they take that egg and they put it inside of the pouch. And in this picture here, you can see those bumps on the back. Those are actually the fertilized eggs inside that pouch as they develop into tadpoles. And then when they're done, they will be pushed out of the pouch. Guys, I told you I had something cuter coming than cats. I've got some frog pictures. And ladies, you just need to know guys and frogs have a special relationship. We like frogs. And there are some really cute frogs. And, and so I want to share, share some of those with you today. But now I've got to be honest. Got to be honest. There are some frogs that are not very attractive, so we'll just get rid of them right from the very beginning here. I know, I know, they're not very attractive. But there are some extremely attractive frogs, and I got to say, oh, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, ladies, guys, frogs, we like frogs, okay? It's okay. It's a guy thing. But anyway, let me show you some of the cute frogs here, right? Come on. That's cute, right? Huh? These are cute. By the way, do you know how amazing a frog is? I want you to think about this. You start with a little lump of jelly, and this little lump of jelly will change, 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 and turn into something that's got a tail, and it's got gills, and it will change, 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 and the external gills turn into internal gills, and the internal gills turn into lungs, the tail goes away, goes away. Guys, if you could spread that process out over a few million years, you would have wonderful evidence for evolution, but it happens in days, and it 
is amazing. Oh, by the way, when they find a frog in the fossil record, guess what it was? Yeah, you already saw the fossil talk, didn't you? Yeah, frogs have always been frogs. One scientist said frogs evolved the ability to jump so that dinosaur wouldn't step on them. Forgive me, can we address that real quickly here? I want you to think about it. You've got frogs that go all the way back to the dinosaurs in the fossil record, and that's a big problem, because think about this. In our world today, there are two animals that are very susceptible to environmental changes. I mean, if there's any pollution in an environment, butterflies disappear. Matter of fact, if butterflies disappear, scientists come running, bring in their equipment. There's something going on. We've got to figure out what's going on because the butterflies are disappearing. What's the other thing that's so sensitive to the environmental changes? That's right, frogs. If frogs disappear, scientists come running. So here's my simple question. Approximately 65 million years ago, asteroid impacts the planet, kicks up all this dust, changes the climate so dramatically that 90% of everything that ever lived died out. But the frogs and the butterflies survived? And by the way, the frogs didn't just survive. They exploded. There's over 3,000 different kinds of frogs. You've got the glass frog. I love the glass frog. I think Christians need to learn from them as well because you can see right through them. You can see what they had for dinner. And I think Christians, we need to be a little bit more transparent. How about this? The common wood frog? There is nothing common about the common wood frog. Remember the weta? The weta that can be frozen solid? Well, how about this? This old frog couldn't be outdone by the weta. They are frozen. They'll survive the entire winter, and when the winter time ends and the summer time comes, watch as this frog thaws out and continues on their way. Now, where did this frog get the information to put antifreeze in their blood. They have to have it because if they don't have it, if you ever freeze a finger or something like that or a toe, you lose it because the ice crystals will form in your blood, destroy the tissue, and you will lose whatever it is that froze. How in the world can a frog survive that? Because they literally have the ability to produce this antifreeze in their blood. Where did that come from? The heavens declare the glory of God. How about this? How about this? This is the smallest adult frog known. I put it on top of that penny just so that you can get an idea. That's a mature frog. That's not a baby. That's an adult frog right there, the smallest known frog at this time. And by the way, if you're trying to feed a family of four, uh, that's not going to work. I mean, you're going to have to do a lot of frog gigging. We used to do that when I lived in Oklahoma. We go frog gigging. You're not going to be able to do that. But if you want to feed a uh, family of four, all you need to do is go to Cameroon, because in Cameroon, you can get yourself a man-sized frog. This is the Goliath frog. This one, by the way, is a small one. The big ones get up to almost 10 pounds of frog, 12-inch leg, 12-inch body. These are huge frogs. And by the way, this frog nearly caused a fight in California, the frog jumping contest. True story. People train their frog for a year, right? They bring it out and drop it and scare it, and, and it jumps three times, and they measure how far it's jumped from the starting point to where it ended up after three jumps. Ooh, world record, 26 feet. One year, a man brought the Goliath frog. They'll jump that far on one jump, and people got upset. That's an illegal frog. You can't bring an illegal, illegal frog in here. People are getting ready to fight each other at a frog jumping contest. I think you need to just chill out a little bit. It's a frog, okay? But they are big frogs. And take a look. This is a Goliath frog next to a baby deer. Do you know what they eat? Anything smaller than them. So don't let the little ones too close. You've got frogs with heads shaped like leaves. You've got frogs. Now, what is that all about? I want you to think about this for a second. What kind of a defense mechanism is that? You've got these spots back here to look like eyes. So here comes something to eat this thing, and this frog turns and puffs himself up and says, don't eat me, I look big. What did he do for the millions of years till he got the dots back there? Hang on, Mr. Snake, give me a couple million years, and then I'll look real big? Guys, how did he ever know that he had the dots back there to begin with? Need a rear view mirror to see that kind of thing. He doesn't have that. Now this frog you better be careful with, because this is the poison dart frog, and they have chemicals Okay, this was a test to see if you were paying attention because the skull and crossbones is not true, but the frog is true. They truly are poison dart frogs and they have chemicals 200 times more powerful than morphine. Now this has led to some really good conversations because I've had young people ask me, why would God create animals with poisons and toxins? Why would they do that? I think it's a fair question, so I'll try and give you a fair answer. 
At the end of creation, everything was very good. Thank you very much. Perfect. No death, no tear, no sorrows. Did these animals need poisons and toxins? No. But did God not know that man was going to destroy everything by rebelling against him? Sin coming into the world to cause the destruction of everything? Yes. So why could God not have prepared this animal to be able to live in a fallen environment? Think of it like this. If you go to your local zoo and they have a poison dart frog, you can literally pick them up. You can lick them. I wouldn't recommend it, but you could. Because they don't produce this toxin unless they live in a certain environment and eat certain foods. Wouldn't have been there in the pre-fall world where it's perfect. I think the fact that God prepared these animals to be able to survive in a fallen world makes a lot of sense. And by the way, let me put it to you like this, especially you young people. Be very careful. What you let into your eyes, your ears, your nose, your mouth can make you just as toxic as this frog. And that's the world we live in right now. So be very careful what you let in. Now, I love this. This is a frog from Madagascar. Oh, the tomato frog. They're a tiny little frog, but they are so... <laughs> they're fun, man. Here comes Mr. Snake. Sin has destroyed the world, so snakes eat frogs. That's just the way that it is. So what's the, what's the frog do? Just like the old horned toad, he puffs himself up to look big. Don't mess with me. I'm big. Hmm. That doesn't scare the snake away. So watch what happens when the snake takes a bite on this frog. Those big old glands that they've got there literally secrete glue. Those white drops are glue. And the glue runs down the body of the frog into the eyes, nose, and mouth of the snake, gluing their mouth and eyes shut. Now watch this. This is the snake after getting all that glue on him. He's trying to get the, trying to get the glue out. I have a question for you. Who taught the frog how to sweat glue? Elmer's? I don't think so. I think the heavens declared the glory of God in a little old frog. Now, uh, it looks like you're getting a little bored with the frogs here, so, so let me change it up a little bit and bring in my big gun. This is the big gun in the frog world. This is Darwin's frog. With a name like Darwin's frog, you know it's got to be good, and it is. Mama lays the eggs. Daddy fertilizes them, and then Mama leaves. Daddy comes back, and he takes care of those eggs, but... Just before they hatch, a short time before they hatch, what he will do is he will swallow those eggs. Now, they only lay a few eggs. Most frogs lay lots of eggs, not this frog, because they can't hold all of the frogs. So mama lays those eggs, daddy swallows them right before they hatch, and he has a special pouch in his vocal cords to hold those eggs. You see that front part that's all rounded? That's the, where the eggs are inside that pouch as they're developing into tadpoles and, in the, and then into babies. Now, what were to happen if he were to swallow those eggs into his stomach? Well, a frog is just like us. Their body produces hydrochloric acid. It would take whatever was eaten and break it down and then waste would come out. Unless you're a gastric brooding frog. Now, a gastric brooding frog, they think they're all gone, but they are amazing. Mama lays like 26 eggs and then will swallow those eggs once they're fertilized into their stomach and you don't care. Anyway, it's a cool frog. You need to go look it up. So here's dad. He's got that special pouch. By the way, when a gastric brooding frog has those eggs in their stomach, why don't they get dissolved? They think that there was an enzyme that was produced to turn off the production of stomach acids so that, guys, how does that happen? The heavens declare the glory of God. So this next video is not indigestion. We're back to the Darwin's frog. And look at the movement on the side here. That's not indigestion. Those are the baby frogs that are ready to be hatched. Now, some people have asked me, well, how do they give birth? Ladies, guys are pretty practical. We're pretty, like, simple. When it's time to give birth, all you got to do is spit them out. And so that's what Darwin's frog was, was uh, that's what Darwin's frog does. They just spit them out. Now, I could spend another 30 minutes on frogs, but you would walk out on me. I know that. So I won't do it, but I'll just ask you, are frogs the best evidence that God created? No, they're not. They're not even close. I already told you, the heavens declare the glory of God. The beauty, the order, the design that we see in the world around us. I mean, a star, there's no known mechanism to make a single star from naturalistic processes. And they scream at us. The beauty that we see in outer space is just incomprehensible. Now, I gave this information in another one of the talks that you ought to go watch called Becoming Bold, but I'm going to give it here. I'm going to give it here again because I think it's worth it. 
how many observable stars are there in the sky? And I'm talking the ones that we can see using the greatest technology that we have today. And that number is a seven followed by 22 zero, 76 trillion observable stars. No known mechanism to make a single star. Guys, that's more stars than grains of sand on every beach and desert on our planet. Ten times more stars. And you think that just happened? Please let me illustrate it for you like this. Imagine that you're at the beach still with me. Reach down and grab a grain of sand, a single grain of sand. You got it? Roll it around in your fingers here. Now, hold that single grain of sand out at arm's length. Use your imagination. How much outer space would a single grain of sand held at arm's length, how much outer space would that single grain of sand cover? NASA took a picture. You can put your arms down. NASA took a picture of that much outer space. And do you know what they found underneath a single grain of sand held at arm's length? 1,500 stars under a single grain of sand held at arm's length? No. 1,500 galaxies under a single grain of sand held at arm's length. You can turn in any direction that you want, and that's what you're going to see. A galaxy is a minimum of a million stars. Minimum. The heavens declare the glory of God. The total number of stars, including the ones that we cannot see, according to the non-Christian, some people think it is infinite, and you have to join me, Christian, in saying amen, because it would take an infinite God to create an infinite number of stars, to speak them into existence from nothing, and know them all by name. And that God said that he knows you and he knows me by name. He knows us more personally than we could ever know ourselves, than, than we could know anybody else. And he still loves us in spite of it. The heavens declare the glory of God. Got to be the best evidence that God created. I'm not trying to be flippant with the scripture here, but I was reading in Genesis, and this caught me. It said this, And God made two great lights, a greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So think about this. Me, I'm looking at the heavens. The heavens declare the glory of God. Amazing! God looks at him and says, Yeah, I made this, I made this, and I made the stars. Yeah, no big deal. I mean the stars. Do you know why? Because they're not the best evidence that God created. They're not even close. Look in a mirror. Do you understand how amazing each and every one of you are? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You were literally knit together in your mother's womb. The, the, the process of a human being from conception to birth is so amazingly complex. There is nothing, nothing that can explain that in naturalistic processes. Guys, you are created in the image of God. You are loved by the one who spoke it all into existence. Loved so much that he died for you while you were rejecting him. Your body, 206 bones in your body. If you break a bone, you ever broken one? It healed back together. We can't make anything that does that. I want you to think about it. 650 muscles in your body. Your heart is going to beat 3 billion times in your lifetime. We can't make a pump to last 3 billion beats. 1,500 miles of airways in your lungs, and you don't pay any attention to that until you get a lot of junk inside there, and you can't breathe. 1,500 miles of airways in your lungs? Guys, I wish I were smart enough to talk to you about the brain. I can't do it. Most complex structure in the known universe. Your heart that's going to beat 3 billion times in your lifetime has valves that can withstand 3 billion beats. We can't make anything like that with all of our technology and all of our wisdom. Your eye, oh, your eye, I don't care how bored you are right now. The fact that you can see and hear this presentation is a gift from God. In order to see your eyes twitch 30 to 70 times a, hear me, second. Your eyes literally twitch 30 to 70 times a second because if they don't twitch, you don't see anything that's stationary. It would just disappear. You have tiny muscles attached to your eye that twitch your eyes that much? Yes. By the way, do you tell, do you tell those eyes to twitch? Twitch, 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 twitch. You couldn't do it 30 to 70 times a second. Guys, this just happened? Given enough time, right circumstances? Let me illustrate it for you like this. Remember our sand carving? Do me a favor, read it for me. Yeah, 
Thank you, Jesus. Do you know what you just did? You just gave me one of the strongest arguments against naturalistic processes given enough time. Let me illustrate it like this. Language. Language requires intelligence. Is it possible that wind and rain and tide could do something to the sand to make it look like a cross? Sure, it could happen. It's possible. Make it look like a picture of Jesus' face. Hey, we get his face on burnt toast. Sure, it's possible. But do you know what is not possible? Language. Language requires intelligence. So now think about this. Take a single strand of DNA, stretch it out, one of the most complex languages in the known universe. Our body is filled with language. Oh, a simple cell, please don't call it simple cell, a single cell inside the human body is more complex than any city on this planet. I don't care how technologically advanced the city is, you take a single cell out of the body, you expand it to the size of the city, and we can't begin to do what a single cell inside of your body does. Mechanisms that take things from one place to another, forget about Amazon, they do it a whole lot better. Something gets in the way, they work around it, this is an amazing system. Language. And you think that just happened. By the way, do you know how many cells your body has? 60,000 billion cells. That's a lot of information. And if you think gas coming from nothing, exploding and turning into everything, explains that, 60,000 billion cells. And if you think nothing turning into gas to explode, to turn into everything that we see explains that, I won't argue with you. There's not a thing I could do about that. But I'll ask you this question right here, as amazing as we are, are we the best evidence that God created? And the answer is, not even close. Because there's something that's so simple, it's all around us, we take it for granted. The best evidence that God created is God's word. Look, when God said that rallying cry of every Christian, when God said in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, he meant it. And what we see in the world is consistent with that. This is why we want to challenge you. Go look at the world around us. Is it consistent with what the Bible teaches or is it consistent with what man is teaching? Because you see, you can use good things the wrong way. Is it working? Yeah, it's working, but I'll ask you, would you want to be on this in a storm? And the answer is no, because you'd drink a lot of water. Well, I'm going to say to you right now that if you allow the Bible to get relegated to just a storybook, good spiritual and moral stuff, the good book, you're using it incorrectly and you're going to drink a lot of water. You see, God said, thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. The best evidence that God created is his word. You can trust it. And I pray that you'll pick it up and study it today to hopefully grow in your faith and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Carl Kirby with Reasons for Hope. Thank you for joining us.